Church, it is yet another beautiful day made even more beautiful by being together with you. We start this morning with a few quick announcements. The first is that there are a couple of handouts included in your bulletin this morning. One of those, two of those should look familiar if you were here last week. They are related to our stewardship campaign. We are focusing on time, talent, and treasures this year, including a time and talent inventory, we encourage each of you to fill that out as an individual, not as a household, um, because the gifts that you have might be very different than the gifts someone else in your household has. You can turn those in in any of the offering baskets, or you can turn those in to myself or Reverend Jane after worship. And this is also a reminder that next Sunday is when stewardship pledge cards are due. Um, and we like to think of a pledge not so much as a promise, but as our hope for the next year. Know that pledges can change at any time as your circumstances do. I'd also like to announce that any new or visiting members that would like to learn more about FCC and who we are are invited to join us for Muffins with the Minister, which will be both myself and Jane on November 19th at 9.30, which is during the Sunday school hour. We will meet in the youth room, which is downstairs. And if you don't know where to go, just hang out by the entrance and we'll come find you. We'd like to remind you to sign up for the stewardship luncheon, which is next Sunday after service. That will be downstairs in the fellowship hall. And you can RSVP by emailing Victoria at the office. Please do so by Wednesday of this week, which means that when you go to bed on Tuesday night full of candy and trick-or-treating, uh, remember to send it, Victoria an email before you go to bed. And then finally, next week is also All Saints Sunday. 
Uh, so if there is someone that you would like for us to remember that has passed in your life, be it in the last year or um, many years ago, please sign up with the worship team after worship so that we can ensure to include you in our remembrance. Welcome to First Christian Church. We are a church that experiences God's welcoming love, that seeks God's wholeness, that hosts the table as Christ does, and nurtures a spirit of justice. Let us worship our God. morning again. Would you please stand for the responsive call to worship and then remain standing for our opening hymn in the procession. It has been said that the church of Jesus is here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So we are all afflicted and we are all comfortable. May we here find calm in times of restlessness. May we here allow restlessness to evolve into action. Let this be the place we consider what we've never considered. Let this be the place we imagine for ourselves something new and yet unspoken. May this hour bring dreams of new ways of being in the world where justice and love are our common purpose. Come, let us worship together.
please be seated and be comfortable. Our joys and concerns this morning, we continue to hold Sherry Baldwin in prayer after her back surgery. She was expected to go home over the weekend, which is great, great news. We also pray for Victoria, our office administrator, office manager, excuse me, who is with us this day um, for she and the Sutherland Flores families. We pray for Diane and Greg Gig Givens. Diane had surgery this week that went remarkably well, all good news, and they are home while she recovers. We pray for one of our nursery workers, Olivia, whose cousin, um, Ava, her dad died in a car wreck uh, yesterday, and so their family is grieving. Uh, we celebrate with Kay, uh, uh, my, I'm not quite awake yet, y'all, so sorry. <laughs> We pray for Katie and Jay, who had an anniversary last week. We also continue to hold the search committee and discernment teams in our prayers and send them all the words of encouragement you can find as they both discern what our future looks like. We give God thanks today for joy and laughter. This morning in Sunday school, the children were laughing at some of the choir warm-ups they sounded incredible, but also a little bit silly. <laughs> we gave thanks for the laughter I could hear from the Sunday school room next to my office, who was laughing hysterically about something I'm sure Phil Summerlin said. And then finally, we celebrate with and pray for Sally D. Hunt, because she got a new to her dog this week. This evening at youth group, we will be writing a blessing and saying a prayer over the dog as it goes home. Our prayer this morning starts with a poem by Anne Weems, but first we will <laughs> join ourselves together in song. one on the edge of war, one foot already in. We no longer pray for peace. We pray for miracles. That stone hearts will turn to tenderheartedness, and that evil intentions will turn to mercifulness. And all the soldiers already deployed will be snatched out of harm's way, and the whole world will be astounded onto its knees. We pray that all the God talk will take bones and stand up and shed its cloak of, self, of faithlessness and walk again in its powerful truth. We pray that the whole world might sit down together and share bread and wine. Some say there is no hope, but we've always applauded the holy fools who never seem to give up on the scandalousness of our faith, that we are loved by God, that we can truly love one another. And so this day, we no longer pray for peace. We pray for miracles. Miracle-making, promise-keeping, ever-loving God, we come to you this day unsure if we arrive out of devotion or out of habit or both. We come to you looking for the Prince of Peace, trusting in the Spirit's moves towards justice and clinging to hope renewed in you. We may not be able to confront presidents or challenge the powers and principalities of our time. We may not have the capacity to divert resources or save countries. 
We may not have the voice to silence the noise of war or the words to negotiate peace between nations. But as we follow you, O Christ, we are able to do something. And so we pray that you would inspire us to commit and act on the small difference we can make. May we bring peace through the small acts of gentleness and reconciliation. May we bring wealth through small contributions and collaborations. May we bring safety through small acts of consideration and acceptance. May we bring wholeness through small acts of care and service. May we bring justice through small acts that change minds and impact systems. In the small ways, O oh God, may our small difference make a big contribution to your reconciling work in our world. We pray that we may do all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. And we join our voices together to pray the prayer that he taught us all those years ago. Our Creator, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Today's scripture lessons come from the Hebrew prophets, Amos and Isaiah. They come from a time not unlike our own, sadly. They were prophets in a way you could say of doom and gloom, but also preaching for people to turn around. And as the beautiful prayer we just heard, to make differences so that we don't have to end up with so much despair and war and famine and destruction. And so they preached and preached and talked and spoke. It made differences in hearts, but it didn't change the outcome. But we are on the same journey to preach justice and joy. So hear these words today from Amos, who preached to the northern kingdom, and Isaiah, who preached to the southern kingdom. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll down like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. And from Isaiah, learn to do right, seek justice, Defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the orphan, and plead the case of the widow. This is the good news. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. 
I met this congregation on a day of justice. Some of you, uh, I was invited by Brandon and some other clergy to travel with your group who went up for Moral Monday, the march in Nashville. And I was so, not only impressed, maybe the night were, but just so glad to see the group of you who joined us from this congregation. And I know if you're here and you remember, it was a day of inspiration. It was a beautiful day. And so that's how I met up with you. And it certainly proved to be the church that you are. Let me tell you that and praise you for that again and again. Let me tell you about my experience that ties into this particular issue of justice. My heart was broken, and I can say this in a big way, on December 14th, 2012. Some of you might remember it, it's etched on my mind, it happens to be my birthday, but it was the day of the shooting in Sandy Hook. And I knew when I heard it, it was devastating again to think this had happened in another school and to children. Sorry for the tears, but it's a broken heart still. And I knew I had lots of Hubbard relatives in that area. And so later, when the pictures came out, I scanned, and there was a redhead, <laughs> she fit right here, with braids, and her name was Katie Hubbard. And I found out later she is a distant relative, and in the words of Jamie and Outlander, blood of my blood, bone of my bone, and I sobbed. It had already touched me, but it broke something deep that remains in me for why we cannot change things, and why again this week it goes on and on and on with children, with adults, with families, a brokenness that should not be. It grieves God's heart too. They were those sort of horizontal tears, you know, you weep and they splash off your glasses and run down your face, but they're healing also. It became my issue, the number one thing I care about. I give extra money I have towards, I try to show up for. It broke my heart, and I know all of you have similar stories for your own issues, things you care about. But a broken heart made tender is stretched, and I felt like that's what happened to me that day. And it continues to happen. It's stretched. There's more room for more love. There's more room sometimes for more pain, and more anger and just disgust with why things can't change. But they're powerful. They lead us to action. And they lead us to decisions to change. They can be our greatest motivation. So pray with me. Gracious God, may the words I share, but all of our hearts, <laughs> perhaps be touched in the place where we've been broken by injustice and pain. And today, sense hope again that we are on a mission that is not endless. It does change. And our world is better places in many times and many places because of the work of this congregation and other people of faith around the world. We ask this in your name. Amen. Justice is really simply defined as the fact that everybody has basic rights. And we could say the most basic are for respect, dignity, and equality. Regardless of who you are, those are basic rights. We also know in time as we mature that justice differs from fairness. We learn about fair when we're little, but as we grow older, we learn that justice is deeper because sometimes what might not seem fair to us that we're asked to perhaps sacrifice or give towards for someone in particular is about justice because what has happened to them, the place, our culture, our society has put them requires from us something deeper. It might not be what we get, but they need it. And so we give. That's justice. It's a tough one to come to terms with. So the scriptures today are about God's commandments. I don't tell you anything new. They're about how to live with and worship into being the people who love God with the whole law, all our hearts, minds, and souls, and our neighbors as ourselves. And we worship in what we say and what we do. It's what Amos and Isaiah were called to do. 
Over centuries, when you read the Hebrew scriptures, you read the stories about how their life together was not unlike our lives together. Religious and political leaders twisted, changed laws, made them fit what they wanted, made them fit so they felt they had power and security for the future, used them to make alliances with nations and get involved in places they never should have been. And because of that, people suffered. People suffered. They, were, they had really, in a way, corrupted the law and corrupted the way that they used it. In particular, those of what were called the holiness code. And you know what those are, the Old Testament, all the ways that people were clean or unclean. In other words, you were okay in the eyes of God. You could come into the temple area. You could be, and women were included that. At certain times of our month, children were included there. Anyone born with any kind of, um, uh, would have been a disability of any sort, were included there, unclean. These actions had broken God's heart, and they break our heart too, and for all those who see the injustice. The two prophets were called to tell Israel and Judah they needed to change. They needed to change for many reasons. They needed to return to what they were called to be, to love God and bring the kingdom of earth here so that justice and love would prevail, and they would be the light to the nations and show a different way for all neighbors. Love God with all your heart and soul, and love your neighbors as yourself. Now both the Hebrew scriptures, as well as obviously the New Testament, we are told that our neighbors are everyone. Everyone, not just people who we like or who like us, or who are common to us, but everyone. But the people of the 7th and 8th century BCE did not listen, or they could not get the ear of the leaders of their day. And so things didn't change. The tribes of northern Israel, we know, at the hands of the Assyrians, disappeared into history, often called the Lost Tribes. They were taken into captivity. And later the same thing happened to Judah. The Babylonians captured their city of Jerusalem and took them into exile. Thank goodness Jesus came also to save us, to change the world, <laughs> give us another chance to hear, hear from God through his example and through the Spirit, provided us the means to live again this call to be about justice and love, and to have the courage to stand up, to speak, and moreover to act in ways of justice. This remains, in my mind, the most basic purpose of the church, to love one another and create the kingdom on earth. It's hard to do it alone. In fact, I think it's impossible. That's why we have a church, one of the major reasons, because together we can encourage one another to be who we're called to be. Acts of injustice are still death dealing dynamics, and they threaten still to corrode justice. We see this every day with vengeance, inequity, discrimination, scorn, racism, structural bias, climate chaos, and it goes on and on. You add your own. You add your own. But justice remains something simple and our call. And here's my favorite definition because it's so simple. We are here to awaken ourselves and others from the illusion of separateness. From the illusion that we are separate. Who taught us this? How did we learn this? Injustice on every level, I think, should break our hearts. But broken hearts, tender hearts, are powerful. The ministry is difficult, and why it's difficult, I think it's because it's very personal. When you speak, when you show up, you're putting yourself and the relationships you have with others in your neighborhood, with your families, with people who may disagree with you. It becomes personal, and it takes courage and patience to do this good work. 
but we can do it because we're not alone. I give thanks for this congregation, and I want this sermon to mainly be a blessing for all of you. It's a great congregation. Your ministry of outreach and all the work you do um, speaks highly of the generations of teachings and pastoring and your speaking to one another have created for this city and in this place. And maybe it's just me because I was a teacher and a family therapist and now a pastor. I think one of the greatest ministries of any church, one of the greatest, and you've got this right too, is to children, youth, and families. And it's not put on Allison, it's all of us. You called her. And you're here with her. Why? Because we know children who are raised in this environment, who learn these truths, become the future of this congregation, this city, and they grow up and become people of justice and love. It's an important opportunity for our future. And then the good news for the day. God's relentless love never fails never ceases. It's always there. Broken hearts are strong, motivated by healing tears, and sometimes when I cry those tears over some of the issues I do, it's with teeth grit. You know that feeling? You're crying, but you're mad at the same time. Yeah. Courage. The good news comes in Isaiah's words. Towards the end of his chapter, he ends with hope, and he says this. With the leading of the Spirit and one another, we will answer before anyone calls. We will hear while they are yet speechless. Help is on the way. It is relentless. It will not be defeated. It will not be deterred. It will not be deluded. It will not fade away. It cannot be denied. There will be a new Jerusalem. Help is on the way right here. So don't be afraid of a broken heart. There's power in your tender places. For everyone has these common rights as well. The right to bear hope. The right to bear a future. The right to hear innocence. The right to bear another day, another year, and a lifetime with justice and love as a guarantee for all. So be it. So be it. It's who we are. What a call. We now have an opportunity to hear from Tom and Emily about some of the wonderful works of committees in this church and you'll be blessed by how you can join them. So we thank them for speaking. Good morning. I'm here to talk with you about the property committee and the communication team. The last time I stood before you to talk about our property was in the spring of this year, a few weeks after we received our capital reserve study, which provided a detailed and blunt analysis of our maintenance and upkeep needs. It was my duty at that time to tell you about the deep hole we are in with regard to the deferred maintenance of our building and grounds. That difficult message was still in my head as I thought about what I should say today and about the stewardship of our property. So I will say right up front, it's complicated. It's complicated because you all know that no amount of volunteering can save our property. And yet it's my duty today to give you a reason why you should volunteer anyway. <laughs> I imagine, for those who've grown up at First Christian, 
that the appearance of the steeple with its rust and missing paint, the chipped paint on hand railings, the locked up classrooms with the musty smell, that these things are the source of real sadness because they remind you of what First Christian has lost. I share that grief even though I've been here just seven years. The Bible tells me that in God's world there is divine expansion and contraction. Certainly that's part of the message so beautifully expressed in Ecclesiastes 3. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time for birth and a time for death. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. None of us believe that now is the time to abandon our property. While we wait for the discernment team to generate the reimagining we voted for, this is where we come to meet God today and for the near future. Ecclesiastes 3 goes on to say, there's nothing better for the people of God than to be happy and to do good while we live. That each of us may find satisfaction in our work, this is a gift from God. So here is my reason for you to direct your stewardship toward the property committee. There is happiness and satisfaction in abundance to be found doing God's work on our property. To borrow some language from a very different world, there are targets of opportunity everywhere. So please consider your talents and help us make the building and grounds the best they can be for as long as our discernment tells us that it is here that we come to meet God. And I will add that since this stewardship effort started, we've had great uh, participation and there are lots of names on the sign-up list for those who can do maintenance work with the property committee and I'll do a, I guess, a premature thank you for that. But it's not too late if you would like to add your name to the list. The table is set up in the Crane Lounge. So now I need to tell you about the communication team. This work group needs diversity. It may be obvious, but these days people of different generations communicate differently. The youngest among us tend to favor Snapchat and TikTok. Midlifers are all over Facebook and to some extent Instagram. And many of our seniors have little interest in digital communication of any kind except possibly email and possibly not even. And it's not just that we all prefer different platforms, we literally choose different words to say literally the same things. See what I did there, y'all? <laughs> I am literally over the overuse of the word literally. <laughs> but that's the 64-year-old curmudgeon in me. And a good illustration of why we need more youthful voices on the communications team to balance me out. The point here is, staying in touch is quite a challenge for a three-person team comprised of two retirees and just one twenty-something, which is what we currently have. We welcome all participants from 16 to 76 and beyond. We can all learn from each other. Beyond social media, the communications team also writes press releases, takes photographs, makes print and broadcast media buys, designs banners, and more. The next step is to make targeted digital media buys, something we almost did for our sesquicentennial celebration, but backed away from to give us more time to prepare and learn about that. And we have new church software that includes a website management tool, which we need to put into service soon to freshen the look of our aging website. So whether you're young, youngish, or young at heart, you may find this kind of stewardship particularly exciting and rewarding. If you think you might, please stop by the communications table in the Crane Lounge after service this morning and talk with me. 
Thank you very much. And I am currently the chairperson of the hospitality team. And um, I'd like to give you a little information which you may already have from your bulletin this morning. Uh, the hospitality team is dedicated to creating a friendly and inclusive atmosphere for all of life's celebrations and stages. We host a coffee in the, co in the <clears throat> excuse me, in the Crane Lounge on the second and fourth Sundays of each month from 10.30 to 10.50. This is an opportunity to greet our visitors and to orient them to the building uh, for children's programs or for special need that they might have. We, um, we have some hearing aid options and we have uh, special uh, dedicated places for people to be able to see the uh, worship time. Yearly, we honor our graduates at a late spring reception to recognize their accomplishments of a long sought goal. Uh, we also host receptions to welcome new clergy and to honor their services when we have to say farewell. And you may remember a recent one that we did. Our committee frequently assists other ministries like evangelism, stewardship, and the discernment committees or teams with muffins for minister, pledge celebration luncheon, which will be next Sunday, don't forget to register, and the discernment luncheons. We have the bi-weekly bi coffees, receptions, luncheons that help to create a relaxed atmosphere where friendships deepen and community is created. Your generous contributions to our annual stewardship campaign fund our hospitality ministry. Please consider adding your time and your talents to our ministry. Whether it's one Sunday a quarter to serve as a host for the coffee, or whether it's for a special occasion luncheon or reception, you can indicate your interest in serving by completing the survey in your worship bulletin or by contacting me personally. Again, I'm Emily Auden and my email is available from the church office. Thank you. Yes, and I would like to add, this is going to be a collaborative effort today, so I would love it if you all could pull out your hymnals and go to 631. Uh, for the first two verses, the choir is going to sing. All I ask is you just sit there and, uh, and, and really think about the words that we're singing and the words that you're reading. Uh, and then for the third verse, I would love it if you all would join in. It's very symbolic uh, and very much in the spirit of uh, Reverend Jane's sermon and in the spirit of the music, okay? That's 631 in the hymnals. You can join us on the last verse.
This is the table of Jesus, lover of justice, grace, dignity, respect for all. This is the world you've created here, and this is the world we dream of. And so it is week we, we come to be fed again for the energy, the courage, and find each other as we move together to be a people who move out of here together to do the good work of Jesus and change our world. And so it is that all of you are invited, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from today, no matter where your heart is, broken, hold, or healing, you are welcome to bring to this table of grace and find what you need here. So please know that you are welcome. Communion, come down the middle. The elders will be here to serve you with bread or else in the cup with gluten-free wafers. We do it by intinction, which means you dip. And if you need, if you are celiac or really need also, we have an uncontaminated bit of wine for you to dip in. So all people are welcome. Oh, it's juice. Oh dear, yeah. <laughs> Least, yes, that's important. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And all the table will be wide. And the welcome will be wide. wide. And the arms will open wide to gather us in. And our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust that there is enough. And, and we will, will come, come unhindered and, and free. And, and our, our aching will be met with bread, and, and our sorrow will be met with wine. wine. met with his friends in the streets of Jerusalem, where we can't help but think of today that part of the world. Body was being broken then, as it is today, and I'm sure Jesus feels as if the crucifixion happens again and again in our world. But when he broke bread, the words were changed for them that day. This is my body, the bread of heaven, which is broken open for you, but from it, you'll find strength and healing. And he also took the cup. And when he blessed it again, he changed the words and told them, this cup will be my blood poured out for you for forgiveness, to set you free, to live the new life in Christ, powered by the Spirit. So when you come today, know that all things have been made ready for you and receive here this gift. And I also ask, I have a feeling everyone here has a broken place in us. Broken maybe in the same way mind is over a justice issue or some tragedy you bring. So bring that today and think of the word when you're here, all things are possible for this congregation and for you. Amen. God of mercy, after another week where it was impossible to not feel overwhelmed by images and stories of brokenness in the world. We give thanks for your standing open invitation to this meal where we experience your wholeness, community, and love. 
We are grateful for the opportunity to remember and to celebrate that the message of this table is one of hope and is the one that Christ sacrificed his life and overcame death in order to bring to the world and to each of us. Bless this time together. Bless this bread and this cup that they might inspire us to follow the example of Jesus and to disrupt the world with the love, the grace, and the forgiveness that we receive at this table as we nurture a spirit of justice in our lives and in the world. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. You may come to the feast.
God of generosity and grace, we thank you for the gifts you give us, for the bread of our being loved, for the wine of our joy, for our life together as people ready to do the work of love and justice. Bless the gifts offered here today, and as we have been refreshed at this table, may we be bread and wine for each other and the world. We ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Church, I field a lot of phone calls these days from churches and clergy alike asking if this is really where I want to be. And I want you to know that each time they call, I tell them, you know, I know a lot of good people these people are great. I have freedom like I have never felt here. Their embrace is warm. Their thirst for justice runs deep. And so does their hope in new mercy. If you are looking for a church where pastors can outright brag about how good those people are. If you're looking for a place that puts the marginalized and the young at the center, if you're looking for a place that might look you in the eye and say, you, Alan, are God's beloved, I encourage you to come talk to myself or Reverend Jane or any of the elders who are Notable because they wear two name tags on purpose. It's not an accident. <laughs> this is a place you would like to call home. We would welcome you, though you should know we have claimed you since day one. Join me now in singing our semi-closing hymn, number 68304, A World. <laughs> So even when there's dry spells in our lives and the world around us, we are strong. Your leaves remain green. Now go with the power of the Holy Spirit and break down the walls of injustice. It can be done and it will be done. Amen. Amen.